Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Public Policy Dialogue Series. I'm Professor Kira Mattis, uh, Associate Dean and Professor of Public Policy here at HKUST, and I'm here to get us started today. Um, so with us, we have a fabulous group of speakers who I'll introduce in a moment, but we're here for a very, very interesting topic because we're at a very interesting point in time for Hong Kong right now. We have uh, been undergoing a shift politically. Uh, John Lee, the CE, has said in his policy address and, and many speeches that we're moving from a period of trying to establish order to establish prosperity. We've had a lot of political and governance changes. And the question we're here to pick up is the degree to which these changes are reflecting in kind of our actual experience, not just of politics, but of governance, of civil society. What have the impacts been? What has our journey been? And where do we see ourselves going? And I think we have a really exciting uh, group of people to pick up this question in a great deal of depth and nuance about the realities of, of government and governance in Hong Kong. Uh, and I think especially because, as we know, that while uh, political dialogue and discourse is very interesting, the experience of most Hong Kongers of government is not about LegCo debates, but about how they see their world on the ground. Are services being delivered? Do they feel like their voices are heard? How are civil society organizations they care about being reflected? And are we feeling like we are now moving on the path we want to go to? And how do we continue to do so? Because obviously we want to have a prosperous and vibrant Hong Kong. So we're going to reflect a little bit on the journey so far and the path ahead. And we have some fabulous scholars. I'm going to introduce them all right now, and then we will go through. Each of them will speak for about about 10 to 12 minutes. Uh, are we doing any Q&A during the? Uh, no, we'll do all the Q&A after, so please hold your questions. We'll have a little bit of a panel discussion, and then we'll open it up to the floor. So if you do have any questions, either in person or on the Zoom, please jot them down, and we'll get to you. So first up, of course, we have our fabulous stalwart, the organizer and, and brain behind all of this one of the brains behind all of this, but uh, on his sixth, this is our sixth season. If we were a podcast, this would be series six. We're, we're cooler than a podcast, but, um, and that's Professor Anthony Chung, who is currently an advisor in public administration to the Department of Social Sciences and Policy Studies at the Education University of Hong Kong, an adjunct professor here at the Division of Public Policy at HKUST. He was formerly the Secretary for Transport and Housing here in Hong Kong, from June, uh, sorry, July 2012 to June 2017, and the former president of the Education University of Hong Kong, then the Hong Kong Institute of Education, from January 2008 to June 2012. And I will say he's one of the most knowledgeable people I've ever worked with around the nuances of government and governance and universities in Hong Kong. Uh, next, we have Dr. Kay Lam, who is a public policy consultant and was previously a senior researcher with the Hong Kong Policy Research Institute, again, a wealth and depth of knowledge and experience. Professor Patrick Nip Takuen. Uh, professor uh, Nip is adjunct professor at the Department of Politics and Public Administration at the University of Hong Kong and an honorary professor at the Faculty of Social Science at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. He was formerly the Secretary for the Civil Service and Secretary for Constitutional and Mainland Affairs of the Hong Kong government. Again, a lot of good experience here. Of course, Dr. Isabella Ng is right uh, next to Patrick, and she is an assistant professor at the Department of Social Sciences and Policy Studies at the Education University of Hong Kong. And finally, last but not least, uh, my neighbor right here, Professor Louis Taylor, is the adjunct research chair professor at the Department of Social Sciences and Policy Studies of the Education University of Hong Kong. From April 2016 to June 2021, he was vice president research and development of the university. So this is a fabulous panel, I think, for the discussion we're going to have, a wealth of experience, insight, research, and practical background, which is, I think, the mix that we need to really ta tackle this topic this morning. So, Anthony, take it away. Uh, good morning, and thank you very much, for uh, Kira, for your introduction. Uh, the topic of today is public policy under changing order. So the first two questions are, are we changing? Secondly, what kind of new order, what kind of order uh, we are talking about. Um, let me start with uh, two quotes from the top. Um, can we enlarge the, 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 the slide, the full screen? Yeah. Uh, from, from our national leader, President Xi Jinping, uh, in his major address uh, in 2002 on the 1st of July, the 25th anniversary of the uh, reunification of Hong Kong with China. And he talked about 
the promotion of development of the SAR uh, and uh, what is considered to be most urgent is to improve Hong Kong's governance system, governance capacity, and governance efficacy for the purpose of uh, uh, delivering uh, better results, better uh, performance in ensuring stability and prosperity of Hong Kong. And then uh, the chief executive, John Lee, starting his uh, five-year term uh, in July 2022. And in his major address in November, he also talked about uh, governance in exactly the same words as used by President Xi. And uh, John Lee said, well, the government will start with enhancing our governance systems, governance capability, and governance efficacy. So in other words, uh, these three uh, are the keywords for ensuring better governance in Hong Kong with the aim of delivering better performance. So I would try to raise some observations and questions about how to improve governance and performance. Now, what has changed and what has not changed? Basically, the new order uh, could be described as being defined by the introduction of the national security law and the um, implementation of the principle of patriots administering Hong Kong, supported by an enhanced electoral system. So these are the main major changes. And of course, um, an immediate result of that is the um, Opposition, so to speak, uh, has been marginalized, if you like. Of course, uh, we can have a lot of uh, discussion about what the opposition had done in the past. And the authority of the executive, as well as the bureaucracy in general, has been enhanced. And there are some changes in terms of organizational behavior and what's happening in the political and bureaucratic ecosystem. But what has remained unchanged, uh, there are some fundamentals which are still there, the basic law, as and under the basic law, of course, the protection of uh, some basic uh, civil rights and human rights, uh, the rule of law, the executive-led system. Some may argue that, uh, in fact, uh, the executive-led uh, principle has been uh, further emphasized. The administration is still bureaucratic, uh, bureaucrat-centric, and we are still talking about a merit-based civil service system, although uh, it is now emphasized that civil servants should be uh, loyal to the PLC and basic law constitutional order. But that has always been the principle. Uh, we are still having the same policy-making architecture, uh, the same representative institutions, but of course, because of the enhanced electoral system, we have new players, new actors, we still have the same process in making policy and implementation. We still have public engagement, impact assessment, but for some may argue that because the players have changed, the ecosystem may have changed, sentiments have changed. So we can examine those uh, changes uh, later on. Now, for me, in this uh, overview presentation, I basically asked two questions. Has it become politically easier to govern Hong Kong? has it become politically easier to make policy and to legislate. Now, there are some arguments that point to uh, an easier path for those in government. The public has become more compliant because of the national security uh, legislation, uh, because uh, anti-government or hate government acts are no longer tolerated. The critical media uh, have been under more check to some people. Uh, protests and rallies are quite rare now, but partly because of the COVID in the uh, past few years. And despite the um, uh, suggestion that the public might have become more compliant, government officials are still quite nervous about what is called uh, soft resistance. Is it easier to pass legislation and to adopt government-initiated policies and plans? Apparently, it might have been easier because there are no more opposition, in quotation, uh, voices in LegCo and uh, the district councils, for example. Uh, no more procedural delay and filibustering, which was quite common 
uh, until 2020. And uh, elected legislators, elected DC members, they all feel that they should be supporting the government. Sometimes, of course, they, they have their own uh, views, suggestions, but all, by and large, the principle is to support the government, to facilitate governance, and to endorse government proposals with modifications or improvements. So to that extent, it might suggest that it's easier to make policy. Uh, easier to forge policy consensus, easier to bring the community on site. Well, that is something that could be debated because there might be uncertainty, as for example, reflected in the recent proposal to impose the uh, waste disposal uh, charges. Uh, is the political culture changing in terms of uh, the fact that there's no more confrontation, less opposition to government, uh, and the new legislators, they all try to support the government even though they still have the constitutional role of uh, checking and balancing the administration. And finally, uh, the uh, establishment. Is it becoming more homogeneous? In other words, less uh, dissent within the uh, establishment. But then, of course, uh, we have to be aware of uh, groupthink. So are we having good uh, room for debate and discussion? The second key question, key question is, uh, has the process become more efficient and productive? The process of making policy, the process of implementing a, a policy. Again, there are suggestions that yes, we have become more efficient, quicker, speedier response, but at the same time, uh, some hurdles are still there, so are we able to overcome those hurdles uh, more quickly? Now, I'm, I'm trying to make a few points. First, in terms of uh, policy goals, I think the government is in the right direction because there are many issues confronting the government, and some of these issues, problems, have been around for quite a long time, and the government are trying, is trying to tackle those issues. But then, uh, as we all know, the devil is in the detail. The devil is in the delivery. And th they're both science and art of policy making and also uh, science and art of implementation. So it's not a straightforward uh, linear process. Uh, bureaucratic hurdles, rigidity, and short-termism abound not just in Hong Kong, but everywhere, in, our, in every government. So how do we overcome that? I, uh, are we able to overcome those challenges easier under the new system or the new order? Local nimbyism remains. So does that mean that uh, with the new order, we don't have local nimbyism? Green concerns, for example, which is quite uh, common worldwide. And um, even though we have the right policy, are we having the right policy at the right time and in the right place. Uh, my observation is that now we have too many new policies opening up many battlefronts. So the government is, have, is having to fight too many battles. Would that make it easier, speedier, in terms of overall response? Have we learned enough about past failures? Why those uh, past policy initiatives have failed? Uh, sometimes not because of filibustering in the, in, in the electrical. I can name one example, which I was involved when I was a government, uh, the introduction or the pilot experiment regarding ELP, electronic road pricing. In fact, that has that uh, objective has been run in Hong Kong for several decades. We are the first, we were the first to uh, come up with the idea before Singapore, before London, but now we are behind because of local opposition, the car lobby, and so on and so forth. Uh, Oftentimes, whether within government, within LegCo, or within the community, we blame the civil servants for the lack of performance. Uh, but at the same time, we have to rely on the civil service to deliver. So it's somewhat a, a, a paradox. And in uh, public sector or civil service reforms elsewhere, we talk about the politics of public service bargain. We have to bargain uh, in the uh, uh, conceptual sense with the civil service in terms of civil service reform because reform has to be through the bureaucracy. So how far could we get in terms of uh, the situation under the new order? The paradox of joining up. 
because uh, with the uh, start of the current uh, administration in 2022, the government has uh, been setting up a lot of coordinating bodies, mechanisms, steering committees, task groups, uh, special dedicated offices. So we are increasing a lot of uh, organizational uh, means to coordinate, to join up the various parts of government. But then, as we can observe from uh, uh, experience elsewhere, in fact, um, uh, there's always this dilemma. How far can you join up? If you uh, set up a lot of coordinating mechanisms, are you making, it more com making the government more complex? Are you adding layers to the government? Are you uh, proliferating officers and agencies? So that would go against the principle of having a flatter, a leaner government. So how do you solve the dilemma? And that doesn't come that could not be solved with the national security law or the enhanced electoral system. Policy research, we've been talking about uh, making better policy, having more research. For example, the previous CPU, which, were, uh, which was originally set up uh, during British time in the 1980s. Now we have the CE uh, policy unit. Is that a great, a big change? Uh, how effective has the CPE been uh, uh, improving the CPU system, so to speak, uh, in the current administration. We talk about results, we talk about KPIs. KPI is not a new thing. Uh, in the business sector, we, we have been talking about uh, management of objective. In Hong Kong, we have KPIs over long. If you look at uh, the government documents every year, we have the policy agenda, which is a list of KPIs. So it's not because the, the past failure was not because of the lack of KPI. Maybe too many KPI, maybe the wrong KPI, maybe the KPI which measures different things. So we have to look at the fundamentals. So these are the two questions I would like to raise. Now, because of the lack of time, I just uh, uh, finished my presentation with this uh, uh, slide. Some critical challenges and constraints remain despite the change of system, despite the change in terms of the ecosystem or the uh, restructuring of the architecture. I, uh, I renamed some. Structural bottlenecks, the land, investment and funding, talent, labor, this has always been the ma major constraints and, uh, and challenges. The overall capacity constraint of Hong Kong, we can't afford too many uh, services because of the lack of capacity in transport, in housing, in terms of uh, dealing with uh, uh, a large number of tourists, for example. Now, of course, we are complaining about not having enough uh, inbound uh, visitors. But then, a few years ago, we are complaining about too many visitors coming to Hong Kong. Leadership uh, capacity. Now, I just, so, uh, I'm not saying that we don't have enough leadership, but I have to emphasize that in terms of leadership, we are not just we are not just talking about a formal leader. We are talking about the capacity to inspire, to communicate, to mobilize, and to unite. Uh, the society has been fragmenting here in Hong Kong as well as elsewhere. elsewhere. The declining uh, public trust, which is, uh, sometimes is not helping policy making and implementation. The capacity to deliver in terms of structure, policy, uh, soundness, uh, people, the fiscal constraint. Right now, we are we are getting worried about the uh, deficit, the uh, fall in fiscal reserve. So the government has to reprioritize some major projects. Risk aversion, which is not just uh, in the civil service, in the bureaucracy, but also maybe in society at large and within the political team. Uh, we now uh, have more discussion about the growth engine, but we can't afford to rely on the old tricks. So are we getting the new uh, ideas, putting them right, and uh, able to uh, be able to implement them uh, uh, efficiently? Uh, we have a lot of plans about infrastructure. Do we have enough money? The planning hurdles, uh, the high cost, and also the risk of delay and cost overrun. Innovation and technology, which seems to be the magic uh, medicine for everything. But uh, even though INT can improve things, uh, big data, for example, it takes time. It takes a uh, more fundamental change to the ecosystem, which has nothing to do, perhaps, with the election system or 
uh, national security. So here are some of the uh, key constraints that we remain uh, to face. So are we able to deal with them uh, more effectively in the new order? So I, I think I'm raising more questions than answers in this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anthony. What a great place to start us off. So next up, uh, Kay. Okay. So thanks, Anthony, for inviting me to this meaningful occasion. Uh, I'm Kay Lam. Okay. I have been working in the field of public policy research for eight years. And two years ago, I found my own consultancy. And uh, today, I'm going to take a practitioner's perspective to share my observation and thoughts on the new political order and its uh, effects on policy making and implementation. Ah, that's yeah. Ah, okay, okay. Ah, yes. Okay. Thank you. So, um, my very first question uh, is that I would like to address uh, the purpose of the new order. So, uh, why did the institutional design uh, of Hong Kong undergo a major change in 2019? Actually. Uh, before the social incidents in 2019, uh, Hong Kong's executive led system has been long uh, described by some scholars as a weak executive led system, meaning that like even though okay, um, the executive had the power to initiate a policy making process, there was no institutional guarantee that the government bills uh, could actually cruise through the legislature um, without opposition because there is no majority party in Hong Kong. And when the legislature or society held strong opinions on policies, uh, they also had means to actually delay or obstruct uh, the passage of bills. I would say uh, from Beijing's perspective, um, I believe that the social incident in 2019 um, further demonstrated that uh, if there are collaborations uh, between oppositions in the legislature and the civil society, uh, that could generate very powerful backlash uh, on policy. After the implementation of the national security law and the enhancement of the electoral system, Hong Kong has entered a new phase of uh, Patriarch's uh, administration. And here are some core features uh, of the new order. First is that the constitutional framework defined by the Chinese constitution and the basic law has not been altered. However, the operators of the system uh, and their behaviors, their interactions within the framework, and the style of governance uh, have changed. Second, uh, the Legislative Council, uh, which is mainly you know, composed of patriarchs, rarely poses substantial obstacles to government policies. Third, the executive branch emphasizes top-down leadership and has, and has established a structure where the Chief Secretary of Administration and also actually the CE can directly reach out to each district, uh, including the district councillors. Civil servants are, are essentially required to accept the leadership of the political appointees and there is an increased awareness of implementing national security. As for governance philosophy, uh, I would say the current government emphasizes on, uh, as what Anthony said, capability, performance and problem solving speed, uh, you know, rather than uh, rigid procedures. And regarding the civil society, uh, some organizations with strong opinions have been dissolved after the NSL and the enthusiasm of the general public to discuss policy you know, uh, is not as high as before. And therefore, in theory, uh, I would say uh, the government can forge ahead with its policies. Given all these uh, features uh, of the new order, uh, what has been changed in public policy making and implementation? Uh, to a certain extent, the new system could be highly efficient and responsive uh, to certain issues uh, especially you know, the issues that the government really cares about. And setting aside okay, the contents and the effectiveness uh, of the policy, purely in terms of speed, um, I would say the effects of the new system is quite evident. Uh, I have a few examples here. Okay, the first one, night vibes or day and night vibes. From conception to execution, it took only one month. The second example is um, you know, uh, one of the government's major policy, live public housing. From the proposal in policy address to the approval of the first batch of funding, uh, it was accomplished within just you know five months. And as for second batch of funding, the finance committee uh, of the LegCo approved the allocation of, you know, uh, more than nine billion in in 
around you know uh, one minute okay uh, 74 seconds actually uh, without the need for a record of vote the legislation of article 23 okay which is also the current government's major policy uh, the consultation has been you know has been you know actually completed okay a few days ago uh, it took only one month and talking about policy response uh, in last year's uh, new you know New Year's Eve a large number of mainland you know Chinese travelers they were stranded in Hong Kong due to transportation and border closure issues. And some mainland netizens expressed you know, a lot of discontent uh, in social platforms, such as Weibo uh, and Xiaohongshu. And the chief executive uh, stated that in future, for any larger uh, scale events or days with high cross-border demands, arrangements and detailed arrangements uh, will be coordinated by the chief secretary for administration and they will also be uh, uh, they will also actively uh, explore uh, extending the border clearances hours even okay the system uh, has the potential strength of being you know highly efficient there could also be delays uh, that we could observe okay recently the government has chosen to postpone the implementation of municipal solid waste charging scheme for the second time and officials uh, have cited the uh, president of Hong Kong Ito. Actually, the chief executive said that uh, uh, the implementation um, postponed for three months. Okay, uh, it indicating that the government has previously delayed the implementation dates of important policy pre uh, measures so that they could be better prepared. The government might have uh, had this idea because uh, actually, after a certain period of you know delay, uh, uh, and then uh, at the period of implementation of Hong Kong Ito. Despite some, you know, occasional obstruction or technical issues, the overall operation uh, of Hong Kong Ito had been relatively smooth. If the government postponed the implementation of Hong Kong Ito to buy time uh, for explanation, I would say this this judgment uh, is, you know, roughly accurate uh, because, you know, leading up to the policy implementation of Hong Kong Ito, actually many drivers okay complain that okay uh, they were unsure whether they need to. Uh, install the Hong Kong Ito and how to do so. Okay, and they had a lot of difficulties in using the you know the app uh, the app. Okay, in in uh, in installing the Hong Kong Ito. And uh, however, okay, in comparison, uh, the waste charging scheme, uh, I would say, is a different policy issue. It involves a larger number of stakeholders, various scenarios derived from the, from the policy, including the involvement of cross departmental collaboration. Uh, it's more complex. Than the Hong Kong Ito. So my question is, okay, uh, despite all these differences from the official discourse, both policies, okay, that require postponement are attributed to explanation problems. Okay, uh, in a system, okay, that emphasizes speed and efficiency, okay, so why do policy delays still occur? Uh, before we go back to the case of uh, municipal solid waste, uh, we could explain uh, the phenomenon from an institutional perspective, I would say. Uh, while okay, uh, placing emphasis on speed, uh, certain established features uh, of the old system or the original system have been uh, compromised or diminished, including that, okay, first it firstly, uh, there is uh, potentially okay, less room for uh, internal debates okay, within the government. Similarly, okay, the time uh, for thoughtful policy formulation and deliberation will be shortened. And there could be less room for incentive uh, for stakeholder engagement as well. And uh, since legislation process is now speed up, uh, it is less likely for issues to be identified okay, before actual policy implementation takes place. And the final point is policy review. Uh, I've heard from some former civil servants that like even uh, before 2019, uh, actually internal policy review uh, was not you know, uh, often or well conducted. But under the new administration uh, that emphasizes you know, governance uh, capability and aggressively you know, promote policy performance, I would say the space and capacity for policy review uh, will be further reduced. And coupled with the distinctive governing style of the current administration, uh, this has further uh, result uh, in further effects. The first is that the government is, you know, is now more sensitive to criticisms and actively counteracts uh, this, this criticism, making it uh, very challenging for citizens to express their opinions. Second is that even though the government claims to have an internal red team, 
uh, actually, I, I'm not sure about you know the specific operation of the red team, but um, the existence of the red team or okay, seems uh, to be contradictory to a government that and uh, that actively emphasizes speed and strongly confirms its own capability. You know, I'm wondering if the red team would be you know marginalized uh, within the government. And thirdly, is that there are also some evident concerns regarding the tools used by the government to measure performance. Okay, I agree with Anthony that okay, uh, you know whether key uh, policies uh, has established uh, KPIs, say night vibes, okay, there was no KPI for this, and uh, whether KPIs serve as a means of monitoring uh, the performance of the government or, you know, to, to justify the performance or give an impression of performance. So this is a question that we will need to explore uh, later in the uh, discussion. And later, and lastly, okay, uh, when the government excessively emphasizes performance, uh, it can also, you know, uh, overburden the government, okay, um, and the prioritization of policies, okay, uh, will be troubled. And I'm uh, referring back to the case of MSW, okay, why would a government that very speed choose to delay policies? I would say, okay, from a state and society perspective, because MSW is a policy that involves not only compliance, but also participation. And without public participation, implementation is impossible. And the government also understand, actually understand this point, uh, that with these, uh, without these objective conditions, uh, there is a high chance of not only delay, but policy f failure. And the case of MSW also illustrates that a whole of government approach uh, in policy implementation is yet to develop, even though, uh, as I said, the government structure has been revamped. We did not see, okay, the active involvement uh, of HYAB, okay, or the, um, you know, the deputy secretary, uh, actually before uh, the second delay of the municipal solid waste uh, charging scheme. And lastly, it's about my concerns regarding the new order. Uh, I would say uh, the effectiveness of the system, uh, it highly depends on the top level decision makers. Uh, likewise, policy reviews also rely on the self-adjustment and the self-learning within the government. Um, my point is that like, even though there is no inherent contradiction between the new order and you know, public consultation, deliberation, engagement, uh, policy research, and a critical-minded legislature, but the question lies in uh, whether the decision makers is willing to create these spaces and opportunities under the new order. And my other concern is that uh, even if the government is willing to change, say, its governing style in the future, say tomorrow, okay, uh, the impact of the prevailing governing style and the political actors' behavior, including the public's willingness to express, will not be reversed in the short run. The culture within the political system, as well as the society's behavior, are not something you know that can be changed um, as easy as flipping a switch or flipping a coin. So once the practitioners and citizens become accustomed to the new political environment, they are less likely to you know, change back or become active again easily. And these are some of my thoughts on the current system, and I would welcome any comments and suggestions and questions from all of you. Thank you. Thank you so, thank you so much. Very thought-provoking. I think uh, we're starting to see maybe some some key themes emerge. So next up, we have uh, Patrick. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Kira, for the introduction. Uh, thank you, Anthony, for inviting me to join this distinguished panel. Um, my key message this morning is very simple: for public policy formulation and implementation under the changing order. At this particular juncture in Hong Kong, uh, I would suggest that the government pay more attention to three areas. First is public policy research and deliberations. Second is transparency. And the third is engagements. Now let's uh, first start by looking briefly on the uh, public policy making process. Uh, there are several major platforms or trigger points for initiating policy changes. Firstly, CE's election manifesto policy address, and budget speech. They are the key platforms where the government would make policy commitments. Now these commitments might be just an idea, a direction, or a concrete proposal. Second is the national policy of the country. For example, the uh, 14th five-year plan promulgated in 2021, and the Greater Bay Area Outline Development Plan published in 2019. They set out the roles and positions of uh, Hong Kong SAL as supported by the central government 
and they form the basis for the Hong Kong SAL government to develop relevant policies. Thirdly, uh, major policy changes as a result of um, a comprehensive review or independent investigation after major incidents. For example, the various review reports published after SARS in 2003 have resulted in the setting up of the Center for Health Protection and the enactment of a new piece of legislation, uh, the famous Chapter 599 uh, on the prevention and control of diseases. Fourth is the, uh, uh, the major policy reforms uh, driven by political, financial, or social considerations. Notable examples are the civil service reform in 1999, the principal officials accountability system in 2002, and the population policy review in 2013. Last but not the least are policy responses to ad hoc incidents or media or social media reports, such as uh, serious fire or traffic accidents. Then uh, let's look at uh, where we were in the past 20 odd years. Now from the perspective of government officials, uh, they have been facing a very difficult to handle LegCo. Uh, there was no guarantee support at LegCo uh, for the government. A lot of adversarial conflicts and fierce opposition, which have made the life of government officials very miserable. Secondly, the, uh, we had a very active and critical media presenting a wide spectrum of views and positions. Uh, some were anti-government and even anti-China. Civil society was very vibrant and diverse, adopting a very strong advocacy role. Many of them uh, were pressure groups, and some were anti-government and even anti-China. Now let's focus on LegCo. In the past, every policy proposal, whether it's trivial or complex ones, would be subject to intense scrutiny from LegCo members. I think starting from 2013, uh, that is for more than 10 years since then, we were facing filibustering from the opposition in LegCo. I recall when I was the director of social welfare, um, putting forward the old age living allowance scheme for approval at LegCo in 2013, we had to go to the welfare services panel three times and then the finance committee meeting five times, spending tens of, hour, tens of hours responding to detailed queries from members. For example, they would ask if the golden teeth of an elderly would be counted as assets in assessing for their eligibility for OH living allowance. So you could imagine that for every policy proposal, the government had to spend significant amount of time and political capital to seek support from LegCo. And very often, it does not matter what position the government took on the issue because the opposition will just take the opposite position of the government, no matter what. So the government would very often refrain from taking the legislative route only as a last resort and would exhaust all administrative means first. And as, re as regards media and civil society, in the past they managed to exert immense pressure on the government. They had the capability to set or influence policy agendas and policy priorities. They would also demand transparency from the government, requesting access to relevant information, data and statistics uh, on policy issues. They would also proactively seek dialogues and engagements with policy bureaus and departments. Hence, they were very vocal, uh, very critical, and some were anti-government in nature. Now, apart from putting immense pressure on the government, very often we would observe that the society was basically silent majority with vocal minority. So, what were the impacts on the administration given the beha behaviors and orientation of LegCo, media, and civil society? Well, it would severely limit the government's capability and capacity to make major policy reforms. Given the difficulties in seeking support from LegCo, over time you would observe that um, our legislation was unable to be kept modern and up to date. And also the administration would be inclined to adopt a very defensive and conservative approach. That said, there were positive aspects. Given the immense pressure from LegCo, media, and civil society, 
the administration had to be very alert and sensitive to policy formulation and implementation process. They had also to be well prepared and thought through all the implementation details before announcing it. The government had to be transparent and outreach in engagements with stakeholders and the public, no matter whether they did it proactively or reactively. Now, after social unrest in 2019, as we could note from the report of the 20th National Party Congress held in October 2022, it says we will uphold and improve the systems for implementing the one country, two systems policy and ensure that the central government exercises overall jurisdiction over the two regions. We'll see that Hong Kong and Macau are administered by patriots and that the laws and enforcement mechanisms for safeguarding national security are implemented there. So this has started the changing phases from chaos to order and hopefully from stability to prosperity. Now in addition to the drastic changes in Hong Kong in the past few years, the geopolitical tensions, the global economic situation, the post-COVID adaptation, and other global issues like climate change and sustainability, etc., have all together presented to us significant challenges and opportunities. I would say Hong Kong is at the crossroads of transition and transformation. It is indeed a critical juncture for Hong Kong. It is obvious that we could not simply rely on the established policies and practices to make Hong Kong tick again. It demands new thinking and new perspectives. It requires some targeted and bold policy reforms. But we all know that the administration is a huge bureaucracy and tends to be risk averse. Their default mode is to maintain status quo and resist change. And be open and transparent is not their default mode. So um, leadership and change management is very important. When I refer to leadership, I'm not just saying leadership in the government, but also in the various sectors of the community. Leadership with vision, but at the same time highly practical, is what we need today. Now, Hong Kong has been facing many deep-seated issues, and in the past it has been difficult to tackle them, partly because of the political and social situation. Now that the government can be more executive-led, uh, it is high time to tackle these deep-seated issues. But we, meet, we need to make sure that we have the right diagnosis, the right strategy, and the right implementation plan. So I would suggest that the government pay more attention to three areas. First, public policy research and deliberation. Our government bureau and departments are heavily occupied in firefighting every day. And the government actually is not good at strategic planning. Hence, I strongly feel that it is a time, more important than any other time, that Hong Kong needs to develop system, mechanism, and culture that promote po public policy research and deliberations, including making the best use of think tanks and universities. Second is transparency. To enable the public to understand uh, the problems, the government's thinking, and diagnosis, the government should take the initiative to be as transparent as possible in terms of government's articulation of the policy measures and also publication of data and statistics. For example, data and statistics relating to the poverty situation in Hong Kong, data and statistics relating to the top talent pass scheme. Thirdly, engagement. Actually, transparency and engagement are interrelated. Proactive outreach to stakeholders and the public would help government to have an accurate diagnosis of the problems at hand and the appropriateness and effectiveness of the policy responses. Of course, the government should proactively encourage and develop the civil society in Hong Kong to make them vibrant again under the principles of patriot administration. So to conclude, the above three areas, uh, public policy research and policy deliberations, Transparency and engagement are particularly important under the current circumstances in Hong Kong. It should be something that the government to take the initiative and the lead to pursue it and to enhance it. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much. That was, I think, again, very insightful. And not just because you are making, you know, my job more secure with your policy recommendations. But, um, <laughs> no self-interest there uh, whatsoever. <coughs> no. Oh, so and uh, next up we have Isabella, oh, who I believe is, are you talking about more about civil society? No, good governance, right? Okay. So on to you, Isabella. Uh, <coughs> thank you very much for... Um, for Anthony inviting me to talk about this topic, and when he sent me the email, I was wondering whether I should join it because it talks about uh, some probably considered to be um, very sensitive issue about civil society. Um, and I just thought um, perhaps I could use this opportunity to uh, to voice out some of the thoughts that I have had. Uh, because apart from being an academic, I also have an NGO that support uh, asylum seekers and refugees, which it, which actually is a grouped team, very unwelcoming in the society. And perhaps just using my personal experience and and also my uh, research on civil society, um, that I could share my thoughts and also hoping that can um, just raise more questions and debates on this issue. So, um, yes. So, um, I, I actually was thinking I shouldn't start with good governance because I have a lot, you know, this panel has a lot of political heavyweights here. Um, and we've got a lot of very, very good um, explanations and discussions already on what the government should do and how, um, what, what are the things that they could improve. But I think generally um, from an ordinary citizen um, and from a civil society perspective, uh, we're looking for something that probably is what he has shown about what good governance is. Okay, I can use this. Oh, yes, sorry. So I'm not very tech savvy, so that's the problem. <laughs> So uh, a number of things that we uh, we would anticipate what a good go what good governance is is participatory, consensus oriented, accountable, transparent, responsive, effective, and efficient. And um, in the previous um, three uh, three powerpoints and you know presented by the three speakers, we talked about a lot of effectiveness, efficiency, you know, transparency is is actually important and. Uh, the government's responsiveness and and inclusive. Now, um, I'm not sure if we have been uh, dealing with equity and inclusiveness a lot, but I've been listening to a lot of the uh, you know inclusiveness and equity these days. Um, I was just being you know called by um, RTHK and asking me if I could do if there I could do an interview regarding inclusion. And so I was really surprised because they said, oh, these are the things that they want to do. That's what the government wants to do as well. And of course, the last one is follows the rule of law. Now, um, here in the new normal, um, when, when I talk about new normal, it's not just po post-COVID. That's what we usually uh, would refer to. But also um, after the national security law, um, how do we how do we think of good governance and what is the relationship between good governance and the establishment or the continuation of civil society um, about the space about the, the space for them to exist and the space for them to speak up and speak out um, and if we look at the good governance those criteria and then we look at uh, what do we mean by efficiency and effectiveness Yes, less opposition, as what Anthony just said, and some challenges, right? I mean, now nobody, or very rarely people will speak up about what is wrong with the government. I mean, and even if people were joking about it, they really worry, oh, would I be caught because of the uh, NSL, right? And more engagement, uh, we've been seeing um, the chief executive going to neighborhood and trying to talk to people. We do see a lot of these, but, but but how far, how in depth could that be, you know, from these visits? How much can uh, can he learn from these visits, right? More responsive, I think Kay has covered this about the responsiveness, right? Um, and one of the key things I, I noticed is that when when people were talking about the new, the possibility of um, of establishing 
Article 23 now not not possibility. I think it's definitely going ahead. Um, and there were opposition, and then the government was jumping up and say, "Oh, I think a lot of people are misunderstanding the Article 23, right?" So how far can the government accept different opinions? And more equitable, then we look at the social inequality and the housing issues. And is it more inclusive, ethnic minority, the disabled, the socially deprived? And when we talk about rule of law, um, Anthony was just talking about that we still have the basic law here, but then we have also the national security law. And how far can the government balance these two and also their commitment towards all these international human rights mechanism, right? Consensus oriented, oppositions silenced. So um, how are we achieving real consensus and the transparency about the process of policy making? And of course, when we talk about participatory, uh, apart from public consultation, that kind of public consultation is a genuine public consultation. Now, so according to reports from the newspapers, um, that 58 civil society organizations have been disbanded since the imposition of the national security law, and many of which belong to political organizations. And some human rights organizations have moved to op moved to their offices or headquarters to other places for fear of the NSL. Um, the Human Rights Press Award, which used to be held by the Foreign Correspondents Club, has been has moved to uh, U.S. and Amnesty International. Of course, they make the public announcement early on as well that they not they no longer use Hong Kong as the headquarter. So CSOs are also uncertain of what and how they can advocate for their causes. I've been talking to a lot of um, civil society organizations, and they do have concerns, a lot of concerns about what to do when we really have issues about the cause they're fighting for and the groups they are supporting. And how far can we talk? Can we really talk to the government? Will it be possible to talk to the media? And if we file submissions to UN, will we get backfired? Will we be prosecuted under the new national security law? Nobody actually has an answer. And nobody knows how to get, get ahead. And everyone is trying to find a way to work with the government in a way that we can engage and we can work together. But at the moment, it seems that everyone is struggling to understand how to use the current space to engage with the government and to engage, not only just to engage with the government, but also to engage with uh, the government with the international human rights groups. So in, in a perfect a uh, utopian idea of CSO's relationship with government, it should be engagement. The CSO should be, the civil society organizations should be able to function as helping hand, as a kind of a nose <coughs> for the government to understand what is going on in a society, especially grassroots organizations, because they are the they are the organizations that would get first-hand information about what is going on within the society. Now, there are four um, functions here. I'm, I've quoted um, an article about what we would expect a civil society organization should function. The CSOs can potentially foster and support grassroots organizations to become more numerous, sizable, resourceful, and self-reliant. Also, grassroots contacts enable CSOs to provide critical information on potential crisis and thus contribute to early warning systems. CSOs are perceived as more flexible, participatory, and responsive to local needs of the poor or prerequisite for sustained development. And CSOs also have a very important advocacy role to play in promoting effective governance. Now, I have highlighted the first one in red, which means that this is not what the current government would, would want to happen. That's definitely a no-no. And the yellow one is kind of not sure what is the position of the government um, in terms of looking at their, their relationship with the CSOs. Now here, that we can see that would 
result in a very for the government to go ahead into developing um, a more what we call a more sustainable society. The kind of attitude that the current government is taking could be a stumbling block. If they want, we, we're talking about sustainable development, a sustainable goal, right? So um, that's the end. That's the end of my presentation. And questions and comments are welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think this is this is such an important element to the discussion. Um, civil society organizations in Hong Kong have have long been vibrant and are so important in getting voices, uh, marginalized voices, and uh, different voices and dealing with issues of equity, right? Um, so uh, I'm sure we're going to have a robust discussion about this. But we have one more speaker. Uh, here we have uh, Tai Lok Lui, who is going to talk about In Search of a New Order. So we have one last talk, and then I'll ask a few questions to get us started. But audience, you know, keep keep your list going, because I think we have some really interesting avenues, I'm sure, for some Q&A. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, speaking in the... Um, Last, in terms of order, uh, the big advantage is, um, quite honestly, I can just sum up what I intend to say in uh, five seconds by saying, you know, most of my friends have already covered the major grounds, and um, I literally have nothing to, to add, um, perhaps except one point. Um, that is, the, the title of my uh, presentation is, um, I put it down in as in search of a new order, uh, instead of what happened after having a new order, because I, I, I tend to think that, you know, we with for Hong Kong society as a whole, we are still exploring how to develop a new order after 2019, after having national security legislation, and having, you know, um, all these new challenges uh, ahead of us. Um, what I see uh, today is the current administration trying to set up is new order. But whether this new order is necessarily the new order for Hong Kong society, I tend to think that you know they, they don't necessarily um, do the same thing. And we should at least still try to explore uh, what would be the um, uh, a new order that would continue to help Hong Kong to be, um, well, using the old words, uh, prosperous and uh, stable. Um, in looking at the new order, I point I want to say, number one is the whole world is watching us. Uh, locals are watching uh, the performance of the government. Outsiders are watching uh, and observing. And this is inevitable uh, because we, we, we did experience uh, major changes uh, in the past years. And I tend to think that, you know, it, it, it would not be very convincing to just tell people that you know nothing has happened, um, and 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 to repeat you know uh, some of the old words by saying that you know uh, everything is back to normal or maybe you call it new normal, so nothing to worry about. Um, I don't think so. The second thing is I I don't think that you know you can simply say something like you know what has been done is no more than a restoration of the old order. Um, I think uh, most of my friends here have already touched on a lot of changes um, in terms of um, um, the, the, the pitch level of the opposition, you know, it's changed. The way that, you know, the legislature has been running is different. Um, interaction between the government and media and civil society has changed and, and so on and so forth. So we are not going back to, you know, what was Hong Kong before 2019 or before 2014. Um, we are now in a different um, context and with new parameters. Um, and I tend to emphasize that, you know, how these new parameters would be handled uh, would be very important. Um, I particularly highlighted the term how is because uh, it requires a lot of skills um, and we do need to pay more attention to it uh, rather than just insert in principle that you know this is the duty of the government to do this you know this is the right thing to do you know this is the the, the right direction and and so on and so forth um, the technique the the way how to do it is important and that's exactly the reason why execution 
and performance are of paramount uh, importance. And to connect this with, with what had been happening in the past 12 months, 24 months, um, my own observation is a lot of times you find small issues actually becoming a big topic among local people. It's only that you know people don't speak it up. For example, how you're going to handle a drama performance. Um, perhaps for government officials nowadays it's not a big issue. But if you go to a Chinese restaurant and have dim sum and num chai, and then everyone is talking about it. Um, you know, is it has it been properly handled? Do you need to make sure that you know the venue would not be rented to the group just you know several hours or two days before the performance? That kind of thing. Um, how you're going to handle small things actually um, would reflect a big issue about how you handled the new parameters. So I think we need to pay more attention about people's observation, people's perception of things that we've been doing. The second thing that we need to pay attention to is about performance led legitimacy. Because I, I, I tend to think that you know the whole idea about setting up KPI, about having you know a tall list of items that you know would be done in policy address is exactly you want to convince people that you know whether you like like the administration or not, it doesn't really matter because we perform. And as long as we perform, then you know, one day you would like, you know, a Sebas. Um, okay, performance space is, is, is okay, it's perfectly all right. But in the past 12 months, again, you know, you, you see a lot of tensions between short-term responses and, and longer-term strategizing. They're not the same thing, they're, they're different things. On the good side is the current administration is at least claims to be very responsive, very willing to come out and, and face a crisis situation. Um, so when uh, some of the mainland uh, uh, tourists get stranded, you know, you, you, you deal with it right away. And then, I don't know, you know, several months later, then we would have um, fireworks every month. So we would have new arrangements for immigration w at least once every month. And then if people say that, you know, they, they want to come over more often, probably we will have new arrangement again and again. Um, but for ordinary people on the street, um, most people would think that, you know, okay, yeah, you, you, you try to be responsive, but, you know, these are not really long-term um, strategies. You need strategies instead of just items, you know, to, to respond. And again, um, in 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 the past year, we we have seen a lot of alarms coming up almost everywhere, and it's difficult to convince Orient people that you know these are issues that would have a quick fix. The fiscal deficit um, is a serious matter. Um, of course, you can try to compare with other countries. Um, so they have been issuing bonds up to 25% uh, of the GDP and then before that, you know, nothing to worry. Of course you can say something like that. You know, academically it is nothing wrong, but then, you know, for people in the business sector, everyone is talking about the issue over dinner, over lunch. Um, you cannot just simply assume that, you know, um, it's, it's not an issue. New engines of economic growth, um, Investment has been put in, and then it's a matter of time that people would look for KPIs, you look for uh, outcomes, and sooner or later, you know, this is about the midterm of the current administration, you've got to show people that, you know, what you have been investing. Not necessarily have very concrete outcomes, but at least to be able to bring in uh, new private investments and, and, and so on. Uh, there have been growing demands for state provisions, and it's very funny that, you know, in the old days, you believed that probably only social workers and university professors would be asking for mel more mel welfares and, and government policies and so on. And currently, you find, you know, even the business sector saying that, you know, you, you do the firework, you do, and other things, you, you, you need to do something for us, and then um, 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 uh, then pen problems will be, will be sorted out. Um, these kind of growing demands have to be handled properly. Restructuring, uh, we're talking about the, the, the general labor market, um, regional integration, um, 
setbacks in the in the service sector, even restaurant, even even friends of mine telling me that you know in the old days, Saturday and Sundays would be the hot days for selling birthday cakes. Nowadays, you you have shops cutting down the the production of shop birthday cakes because people are having their birthday parties across the border. Um, all these have implications, and then there's a long term issue. So. How are you going to current administration to, to look at these sort of things in order to enhance its own performance and then to convince people to accept it as a legitimate uh, a government? That would be a big challenge. And lastly, the point that I think already touched my, my friends and is, is where the new partners. Um, we have seen a lot of state initiatives, short-term things that items put on the policy address. And in the past, period of time that again um, it is becoming a topic among ordinary people is that you know we have seen too many faces of top officials running around taking photos uh, uh, are we having too many of them you know do they have anything other things to do rather than just attending opening ceremonies um, we we expect them to you know work hard on on, on macro issues strategizing and and and, and so on um, also you know um, Having more state initiative, of course, this would itself is not a problem. But then, have we seen enough responses from the business sector to drive further development? Um, has the old formulas of you know the, the government only facilitates and promotes, and then you can leave the rest to the market to respond? Well, we we haven't seen enough market responses. So where are they? Would they be coming along uh, in the next few years? Um, the government has been described as very willing to take up um, its own responsibilities. Uh, but then the thing is, like Kay has shown us you know, forcefully, is that if you want to implement um, maybe you know, the question about waste, maybe question about other issues about how to manage the city, you do need to have you know, cooperations from the ordinary people, from our society. So what is the role of the broader society? How are you going to encourage them to share the responsibilities? So in the past, again, 12 months, we have seen governments attempts to do mobilizations. But what are the results? What are the effects? If they are not good, what are the reasons? And then this leads to the questions about we need policy reviews, we need evaluations. And so as a result of that, all this discussion, I think the simple word is we need reflection. So. I'll stop here, and thank you very much. What a, what a great set of, I think, really insightful and very thoughtful um, speeches. So w when I first saw the title and the blurb on this, I admit I was a little nervous because I said, depending who you bring in, right, this could either be a very thoughtful reflection on where we are and where we've been. Um, we'll worry about that. We'll worry about the, uh, the online questions and stuff in a second. So we're gonna, we'll take the Zooms and the questions, but first we're going to have a little talk amongst the panel. Um, so I, but I, th I think this is a really important set of discussions, and I think we've accounted for a few really cross-cutting themes across everybody's uh, reflections. And also, so you know, I'm a I'm a policy scholar, so I'm I like to I like to analyze things, but I'm also very interested in in thinking about how do we move forward, right? We've all asked a lot of questions. Not that we'll we'll solve all of this obviously today, but but what are some ways to move forward? And the first question I want to pick up is about a theme I saw running here, which is voice. So when I got here in 2017, I would describe Hong Kong as a cacophony, right? You have LegCo filibustering and the media all over the place and lots of civil society groups. It was a, it was a very exciting, but, but perhaps too noisy sometimes, right? Like to the point where you couldn't say anything without 15 people coming to tell you how it wouldn't work and how are we going to move forward, right? And, and, and that can be a very real concern. And I think now what we're seeing, we're like a little bit of a Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Too noisy, too quiet. Right now, now we're concerned that the the things that people are saying around the table, the very real uh, things that that CSOs see. Right, let's think about CSOs. Their job is to understand and see what they do is understand and see people who have inherently less voice, who might be overlooked uh, by our, our even our most dedicated and skilled civil servants. So the first question is, what do we see as potential ways forward to constructively? bring more voices back into the process, right, in ways that enhance 
policy formulation, but also policy implementation, right? Because I think the waste charging scheme is a great one we could probably talk about all day in terms of this sort of issue, right? So does anyone have any thoughts about how we go from, you know, cacophony to crickets to maybe uh, appropriate channels of, of effective differing opinions, ideas, viewpoints in the, in the government to lead to more effective policy? Kira, I think you 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 have raised a very important point about voices. I think we need voices in our fo policy formulation, and implementation is not just a, a very linear process because you do face uh, things that you haven't thought through in the process of implementation. Again, you need voices and the feedback, which in the literature, in terms of theories about policy making implementation, uh, is very important. Uh, Patrick earlier mentioned that in the past, when electrical politicians were trying to filibuster to make all kinds of noises in addition to voices, that the, with the silent majority, the majority was silent. Now we want the majority to, to be vocal, right? I mean, that's the whole purpose. When we talk about the red team, in fact, the society should provide the red team, not just sp special people within the administration. But I think uh, probably we have gone to the other extreme. I mean, in the past, we may have too much filibustering, too many noises, voices. Some of them were not entirely constructive. But now the question is, are we having an overkill? Are we sort of suppressing, whether by default or by design, different voices to the extent that we were not fully anticipating uncertainties factors in the process of making policy and implementation. Now, uh, yes, you can have very speedy responses, but if those responses were not th well thought through, I mean, the consequences might not be what you have intended, and you, may be, you might have created even more problems for yourself. So I think uh, what the panelists, uh, I've been listening to what the others have said, I think uh, we are trying to say that there are fundamental factors that should not be overlooked despite the attempt to try to deal with the old problems. Well, um, I think this, the short answer is uh, for the all the relevant parties, including the government, uh, the community, uh, the relevant organizations, um, to, to continue to play their proper role and do their job. Um, and in particularly, for example, to start with the government, as I mentioned, um, uh, need to focus on the strategy. And when you deal with the policy issues, uh, what are the strategies? You need to articulate the thinking behind to the public and so that the public could have an opportunities to comment, to give their views and on, on, on that. And, um, and then and then is the transparency. You, you need to provide the data and statistics information for someone to comment, to work on it. A and engagement. I mean, the proactive outreaching engagement is very important. Uh, I recall that when I was the director of social welfare, I make it a rule myself. I definitely would uh, went out every week to visit all the relevant uh, units because that's where you could get the ideas, you could talk to the people, and you know the problems. So it's very important. And then for the uh, communities, including the, um, the think tanks and the universities, I, 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 I think it has a very important role to play. Um, the media... Uh, uh you know, to to reports on um, the the communities are concerned. So it's uh, it's uh, the CSO, the uh, the civil society organizations, um, to come out, and then the media will report on that. So uh, in brief, is that for all the relevant parties just to continue to do their job properly, to continue to do it. Uh, talking on talking about bringing in the voices. Uh, actually, from my last slide, uh, I said that uh, there is actually no inherent contradiction between the uh, current system and a critical-minded legislature. So um, from my observation, actually after the uh, institutional changes, some members of the legislature have gradually assumed some critical roles uh, in the legislature, like indicating that the system actually allows room for critical debates. But the question is uh, whether the uh, executive branch is willing to accept okay, these questions and even criticisms. Say, okay, do they provide sufficient policy information uh, to the legislature, enabling meaningful discussion in the legislature? Uh, actually, I have uh, read some news reports, okay, highlighting you know the brevity of some government policy documents. 
nowadays. Say, for instance, uh, in the case of Belt Road Scholarship, uh, several legislators they express confusion over the government's decision to allocate one billion, uh, despite a surplus in the scholarship fund during you know a period of fiscal deficits in Hong Kong. So um, I read the news that the Education Bureau submitted a six-page document requesting for the allocation with only one paragraph providing an explanation on the financial arrangement. So if this is the case, uh, it becomes challenging for a vibrant legislative culture to, to develop. So I would say the executive would need to take a step okay, uh, in order to allow a more you know, a critical-minded legislature to develop uh, under the new system. Interesting discussion uh, to be had about the need for a space in a system that encourages uh, a legislature or a legco that that focuses on things like accountability and learning and, and you know and, and holds the achievement, which is different than just disagreeing and filibustering, right? And I, again, I wonder if the it's not so much the system but the style, right? Because we have we have leadership style and we have a political system, and it seems to be we're in this period of, as you say, kind of figuring out what we can do, what we should do, how to how to make that work. Because as you say, without that, it, the accountability function of the legislature, you know, uh, is, is undermined. And again, that's a very important kind of uh, political feature. Um, anyone else, Isabel, do you have uh, this bit uh, of a perspective? I, I, just want to, I just want to echo with what <coughs> Patrick was talking about, to kind of like everybody has to do their own, you know, job properly. Um, I... I think a, a lot of times that, you know, after this, the implementation of the NSL, um, the government hasn't been really trying to make an effort to reach out to the civil society organizations and explaining what that would mean to them and the impact of which to uh, their work, e especially CSOs. One of the key functions of CSO is advocacy, mm -hmm. right? And, but... But then in reality, I mean, I had an experience of seeing how that um, we could work together and engage. Engagement is very important. Is when during COVID, um, the, the asylum seekers actually and the refugees, they couldn't do the, the jab, mm -hmm. yeah, the, the COVID jab. And then, and then that get really increasingly serious. And we got um, a media reporting about this case. And then a group, because we, we had a network, so we started discussing what to do and how we lobby the government. And I think Patrick was, was actually the key person dealing with us. And so we understand, we actually understand the, the, the kind of challenges that the government was facing because they are not really Hong Kong citizens. And in order to give them the, the free jobs that, would, that could be backfire. So we were having discussions, I mean, amongst the... the the CSOs, and then we said, well, we, we need to have someone to talk to the government and see how we could do to help the group while we won't get get the government into trouble. Mm -hmm. And at the end, we did it really well, and the asylum seekers and refugees were given uh, a chance, and, and the international social services were actually the one com communicating, because there will be lots of logistics required. We need to ask for their consent, and they come from different countries. We we th the government needs to make sure that they have, you know, people, translators, and you know, documents, pamphlets ready, steady for the for the claimants to be able to understand the impact of doing the job, right? And so th it takes all parties to work out, and it worked out really. I think it worked out really well, and that is actually a key example to show to the government that um, that CSO is not just about opposition. And CSO's main function is to be able to alert the government uh, what is going on. And, uh, but, but currently, I don't see that the government is taking a very proactive role into explaining that how they could work together and what they could do in terms of advocating for the cause or for the groups that they're supporting. I think it's important for the government to communicate clearly to the CSO what they can do uh, and how they could work together instead of just um, having, basically, if you see in the media that the discourse is, is about, oh, nobody should go against the government and and then anything is deemed to be sedition. And so now the, that, that actually was creating a, a sense of fear and anxiety, which 
nobody wants to talk and everybody keeps mum because what am I supposed to do if I I do something? Then if I talk to any international human rights organizations, I may deem, you know, that I'm against uh, the government and, and the country and I'll be put in jail, you know. And and these are the things I think um government can do, and to engage the CSO so that we can move forward. I think that's very that's a very important step. Um, yeah, I, I I think all of us here have been saying that you know there's there's n nothing within the um, so-called executive-led system to say that you know we, we we don't need consultation, we don't need engagement, and so on. So there's nothing contradictory between engagement on the one side and and executive-led um, uh, uh, governance on the other side. Um, so it's exactly about how much space the kind of style that you really want to um, put forward. And I do think that, you know, the experience in the past two years are good lessons for us to learn. You know, when the government's facing too many friends, when you have so many friends that they don't tell you what they have heard, mm -hmm. and then they don't really tell you about, you know, what things have gone wrong or maybe going wrong, then exactly, you know, the, the, the issue about charging uh, waste um, management. Exac exactly the case that, you know, when, when before what happened, then everyone's saying that, you know, this is all okay, you go on and, and, and going to be all right. And then suddenly you have a change of public opinion and then voice became to come out. And then suddenly you find all the former friends becoming people saying that, you know, you shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't just um, focusing on penalizing ordering people and you got to change. And as a result, you, you you delay. And in the process, process, I I think that you know it's just not just about whether you can deliver your policy, but it's also an e erosion um, of the uh, image of 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 the government. So one thing I I think about a lot, um, partially from people I I spend a lot of time working with professionally in other places, is that public engagement is an art. Right. And it's an art that's been advancing in a lot of other places, but I would argue it is not as advanced uh, in Hong Kong. And, and as it even is perhaps over the border, as my students constantly remind me in my public management classes, the ones that come from the mainland, um, they're much more attuned to how they can, they can be con consulted or, or, or feedback into things uh, in their hometowns than here. So how, you know, if we think about Hong Kong people for a minute, what what are the best ways you know in the in this kind of the age of 2024 to actually get you know th conversations from our lunch tables and our our dinner parties to the ears of people who need to hear them right how can we engage with the hong kong public these days uh kira i i think um you you have uh, rightly pointed out that it's an art in terms of engagement I mean, we are not just saying, well, in any consultation, the longer the consultation takes, the better. But because exactly not, you right? may create even more differences. So the, the, the challenge really is how to consolidate mm -hmm. such diverse diversity in terms of feedback. I mean, in Hong Kong these days, I mean, for example, uh, I remember the task force on land supply, uh, uh, land supply a few years ago. Actually, it created even more differences. So how is government able to say, okay, based on the feedback, then this is the consensus? It's so difficult now to achieve a consensus. And I think if the people, um, they are more willing to sympathize with the government, they are uh, more appreciative of the problems that the whole community is facing, maybe the better. So the, the focusing of the problem, I think, is important. For example, in terms of the uh, municipal waste uh, uh, disposal charging, somehow I think the emphasis was put of on the purchase of authorized uh, uh, rubber bags, the cars and so on and so forth. So uh, this the, 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 the principle of how to reduce waste, the principle of recycling was lost. So I think it, it, it depends on how you articulate the narrative of the policy, the problem you're facing. Yeah. Um, <coughs> well, I think uh, public policy uh, making is uh, both science and art. Um, 
science is that because um, uh, scientific analysis and relevant data and facts to support it are very important. But it's also an art of balancing. It's, uh, it's, uh, you always need to strike a balance between efficiency and quality. You need to strike a balance between short-term defects and long-term consequences. You need to strike a balance between top-down and bottom-up. So when you, when you, you when, when, when you really need to uh, deal with a, po a, a policy or policy reforms, then firstly, the administration needs to do the proper job of making all the top-down decisions first. I, took, I take the examples of um, you know, the COVID uh, vaccination program. Um, we have to set at the outset about uh, whether it's free of charge, whether it's centrally procured by the government, whether the, the, the public should have a choice of the vaccines they, they would take. And then you set out the strategies about, um, you know, I setting out all the venues they come forward, and then I second stage, I outreach to all the relevant sectors, and eventually I do home vaccination. Then you leave all the relevant parties to do the bottom up, because they would then have a lot of innovative and creative way of thinking about the delivery of services. So, so it's, a, it's a balance of uh, doing a top down and bottom up. You can't start with, well, in the past, the government always saying that, oh, we, we do not have any position on this matter. So uh, we are doing the co over, uh, co consultation and uh, views are welcome. We do not have a position because of the political and social situation at that time. Now, uh, it's more executive led. So the government should start with uh, saying on a policy, uh, what's the parameters, what's the thinking, that's the top down. And then you will invite, set a framework for inviting comments and inputs on that. Um, so um, there are formal channels for, um, for collecting views, uh, the administration, the LEFCO, the district councils, advisory boards and committees. There are a lot of uh, these formal channels and also through the media and uh, the organizations. So it's a matter of uh, how these uh, relevant institutions and channels uh, uh, are, are whether they are effectively used or not. And then comes to the, um, to the informal channels. The informal channel is that whether you are really outreaching, mm -hmm. uh, proactively seeking engagements and all that. Um, people are always saying they're commenting that all oh, the, the, the government officials attending all these opening ceremonies and all these ceremonies, they are, they are well time wasting and all that. I, tell, I tell you when I was the director of social welfare, I make it, I, I, I make it that no, all, so Saturday and Sunday, I attend all these opening ceremonies, all these important events. I find it extremely useful because you spend an hour there, you spend 45 minutes there, all the board chairmen, the CEOs, and all the important people will come forward and tell you what are their concerns, all the problems. They want to bring it to the attention of the government. So it's so efficient of use of time. You spend a 45 minutes, you basically have a diagnosis of the problems at hand, and what are their concerns and what are their uh, wish lists and all that. So, so in a way, it very much depends on uh, your, 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 your mindset and your approach uh, to, uh, to, to various uh, uh, activities or events. I have a point to add here uh, regarding the point uh, about public engagement. Um, I think um, there are some limitations uh, on the part of, a, of the government in problematizing the issue, okay, especially for em environmental protection. Uh, I would take another example um, is the uh, construction waste disposal charging scheme, because uh, I actually read okay uh, the leaflets designed by the Environmental Protection Department, and uh, the first leaflet okay is about you know the strategy okay which is fine, and then the second leaflet is about the penalties, the third and the fourth leaflet okay about instructions to make payments, and the last leaflet okay is about you know the disposal costs. But none of these leaflets, okay, uh, you know, talk about the original intention of the policy and the overflowing of the landfills in Hong Kong and the hazard of, you know, construction waste in Hong Kong. Similar things happen to the multiple solid waste disposal. Uh, I think, okay, if you want to convince the public that uh, the policy is important, you need to, okay, uh, address uh, these issues in the promotional materials instead of, you know, overshelling. Uh, all these, uh, you know, important political issues with technical issues, the cause and how you make the payments. So, uh, if you do it in this way, okay, I think uh, it leads uh, to, you know, uh, a uh, consequences that the public would 
have ignored, okay, all these promotional materials. And the second point I want to make is about uh, how to do public engagement, because uh, actually uh, engagement is uh, one of my research interests. And uh, I actually attend, okay, uh, the public meetings of uh, Land for Hong Kong, okay, uh, a few, few years ago. And at that time, okay, uh, you know, um, actually people attend these public meetings uh, not for discussion, okay. <laughs> they are here maybe to insult the officials or <laughs> they're here to demonstrate their stance, okay, instead of, you know, here for deliberation. But nowadays the political culture has changed. So I think uh, it opens a new opportunity for the government to re-engage the public, okay, because, you know, uh, less oppositions are here. So uh, I would say uh, instead of, you know, closing all the uh, policy discussion, this is the right time to reopen all these engagement ex exercises. Thank you. So I know we probably have some questions on the floor, if, if that's okay, because we've got about half an hour left. So uh, we had one on the, we had one clarification question on the Zoom, but I, I don't see it. Anymore. Okay. Uh, this is someone from the central, uh, sorry, Census and Statistics Department. Uh, in Isabella's talks, do the grassroots organizations refer to nonprofit, non-government organizations? Yes. Okay, great. That was an easy one. Okay, uh, perhaps. <laughs> well, they, they may be easy like that, or maybe not. From the from the floor, do we have some? Um, Wendy. Yeah. I'm Wendy Hall. I'm a, a legislative council member. I I totally agree with the host that this is a very important discussion. We really very much. It's the right time. Uh, timing to do some, you know, uh, discussion at this level. So thanks so much for your sharing. Um, I would like to uh, hear a little more uh, from the speakers on um, two uh, models or two uh, styles of the governance now I observed. The first one is so-called um, KPI-driven or uh, uh, performance-led uh, governance. You know, in the past, we discussed a lot, and uh, we never make decision. We make a lot of decisions. We never take took action. But now, like the um, uh, pendulum, we swing to the other side. We are so efficient now. And sometimes we uh, try to achieve the KPI with no, um, with n uh, at all costs. We don't care about how much it costs. We just want to deliver. We are so eager to show the society we are e an efficient government. Let me give you some examples. We, we use 50 billion to move the uh, sewage treatment factory uh, in Satin to a cave, 50 billion. And uh, you know, we, um, um, the land created by moving uh, uh, so the sewage uh, factory is 80, uh, uh, 28 hectare. Uh, it, it is capable of building 10,000 housing units. And if you calculate the cost per unit, it costs the four, uh, 400, so uh, sorry, 4 million to 5 million per unit. That's just the, the uh, land work cost. We have to add land cost, construction cost, and other costs. And the 70% of that housing would be public, land, uh, public rent housing. It's crazy, you know, the cost is increasingly high. Another example is we move the, um, it's a water treatment factory in Jun Sana, Diamond Hill, also to a cave. It costs uh, 2.5 billion. And uh, the land is uh, capable of building 2,000 only 2,000 public housing units. It's a tinga. We sometimes try to, you know, please or try to deliver with no, um, without consider is this a, ris uh, a reasonable or responsible investment. This happens a lot in the now, like the light um, public housing, uh, uh, 30, 30 billion, and the trans um, uh, um, transfer housing, 10 billion. There's a lot of such cases, and uh, we, 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 d we try to uh, 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 deliver at all costs. This is one, one style. Another is um, demand-driven uh, governance or demand-driven uh, policy making. Uh, sometimes we just uh, see the demand, and we try to satisfy all the demand without consider is this appropriate 
strategy to do so. Like uh, we now see a very long queue for public rental housing. Uh, so the government um, try to you know, shorten the queue and uh, we pour all resources to public rental housing. The result is that the queuing is adding up all the time. Many young people try to limit their salary in order to be qualified for pub uh, uh, waiting for public rental housing because we have not a housing ladder above the public rental housing. We put all resources in the bottom and you have no ladder to climb up. But the ch we, we never think about what is the appropriate housing uh, structure for Hong Kong. Now, more than 30% of families living in public rental housing, this is the highest in the whole world. And we are now adding more that we never have a vision for the future. So this is a, this is a very, sometimes very frustrating for me. I try to <laughs> advocate for, you know, um, a little bit of long-term strategies, but we are so busy up with, uh, you know, <laughs> KPIs. The reality. <laughs> Thank you. And I think this this comes to a lot of points we've already heard, right? Yeah, one is yeah. one is the need for more public policy and think tank research. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. and, and and strategy. So I think probably a few of you here definitely have something to say about these kind of these two models and the the challenges yeah. they're in. Yeah. Maybe let me uh, uh, respond. Uh, I think Wendy, what you have pointed out uh, is very typical of day to day policy making, day to day policy delivery. Because it demand is a very uh, funny thing. People demand because they don't know whether you have to supply or they don't know how much capacity you have to supply. Demand can come from need. Demand can also come from greed. So it's all a matter of balancing. I mean, in, in the government, you have to really go beyond the demand to look at, well, what is the real problem? And problem today, uh, I mean, or solution today may be a problem later on. So the long term and the, uh, the short term, you have to do the balancing. The community cannot do the balancing for you because the community doesn't have a good grasp of all the information. Government, relatively speaking, has a better understanding of the issues, the, the, the problems, the, the statistics, and so on and so forth. And in terms of um, KPI, um, Actually, it depends on how you, def how you come up with the KPI. Remember in Hong Kong, since the 1990s, we had experimented with uh, performance pledges. Now, performance pledges could be both a top-down and bottom-up uh, exercise. Top-down in the sense the top leaders may say, well, I want something to be done. But most of the time, in terms of the uh, details, particularly the te those details, they have to do with technical things. Now you have to listen to delivering bodies. And because it all depends on the consequences of KPI. If you c for a government department, if you cannot meet the KPI, there might be grave consequences in terms of budget, in terms of other things, penalties. Then you come up with KPIs that are largely achievable. I mean, this is quite typical, not just in Hong Kong, but everywhere, in every place. So my, my view is don't make the KPI a myth as though once you set a target, it will be delivered, everybody will be happy. It's not as simple as that. There are many sort of uh, hurdles, many points that you have to overcome in the process. Uh, yes, as uh, Anthony said, uh, KPI are not new things. Uh, in the past, the performance pledges and all that. And and one has to look at the KPIs, whether it's output-based or outcome-based. Because what we are concerning about is the outcome, right? And not output. Um, and also the KPIs, the purpose of KPIs are actually is a reflection of the policy priorities of the government. Uh, this is the key, this is the um, focus areas, and you want to achieve results, and so you, c you, you set out some uh, indicators. And also in the past, uh, the, the, the bureaucracy tends, uh, tends to tell you how many meetings they have held, how many people they have met, but without telling you that uh, what actually they have achieved. So uh, I think these are all the background leading to um, the uh, KPIs. Uh, but, but KPIs are not new things, 
and it should not be the only indicators that you need to focus on. And as uh, the, um, the relevant speakers are all alluded to, uh, more importantly is the strategy. When you face with the policy issues, what are the strategies that uh, we have in mind? Um, in terms of um, public uh, housing, light housing, it's important that they want to shorten the queue, they want to have people uh, uh, getting the uh, public housing uh, early, earlier and all that. But then, but then there will be costs involved. Um, so eventually, at the end of the day, it's a judgment. And there is no exactly right or wrong. It's a judgment. And it's a judgment, uh, you know, ideally, it should reflect the, 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 the judgment or the consensus or the views of the community. So that comes to the point about the importance of um, setting out the strategies and then support it with uh, analysis, research, deliberations, facts and statistics, and that comes to the think tank and all the uh, relevant policy uh, deliberations. Because when you put all these figures, relevant information out, and then with a proper and vigorous policy research and deliberations, then you will let the whole community know about the issues, um, the rationale, the approach that you are taking, and what are the likely outcomes and the effects, and what are the costs. Then you would then take a considered a view on the way forward. So that's why the, uh, that, that underlines the importance of uh, having a, um, uh, a uh, vibrant uh, media, CSO, and also uh, open government, and a culture of um, you know, encouraging public uh, policy research and deliberations. I think that all points to uh, good policy decisions at the end of the day. That's what we all hope for. But after all, it's a judgment, it's a judgment. Uh, and talking about KPI, um, actually, okay, currently the government is trying to, you know, uh, you know, play fireworks uh, every month, and they said that uh, we don't have KPI for that. Okay, that is difficult to measure, and we are not taking dollar sign for this. But uh, from my perspective and expertise uh, as a policy researcher, I actually try to, you know, study, um, you know, the places, uh, other places that also have firework events. Actually, they have a, a means to measure the effectiveness of firework events. Like uh, they can count the number of you know, participants, you know, the amount of money they spent, whether they came to the place because of fireworks. Okay? Uh, there are similar researchers in like San Francisco. So uh, I think if the government is really willing to measure KPI, there are actually ways to do that. And the second point uh, is about policy research. Uh, I actually, you know, uh, expected that the C CPU uh, can do more regarding engaging the think tanks in Hong Kong because, you know, previously uh, when I was working in Hong Kong Policy Research Institute, uh, the previous PICO uh, in Chinese Chongsun Ban, uh, you know, they have, you know, uh, you know, uh, monthly visit uh, to uh, the think tanks to see what they are actually doing and trying to incorporate, okay, some of the research reports from the think tanks. So uh, I would say uh, it is, you know, important for the ecology uh, of policy research to develop in Hong Kong. Uh, but sadly, okay, currently I am seeing fewer think tanks uh, publishing reports in Hong Kong. And I would say there is a distinction uh, between, you know, public reports and private lobbying. Because uh, public report is about open discussion and open data, okay, instead of, you know, just you know, dialogues between the government and think tanks. So I would say uh, think tanks, I agree with Patrick, uh, we can take up more roles uh, in public policy making in Hong Kong. Okay, if I can jump in here, it's um, even for the so-called KPI approach, uh, the problem is that it's, it's not consistent. Sometimes telling you that, you know, you, you don't really need to focus on the, on the dollar sign, sometimes, you know, it's about goodwill, and that kind of thing. So you, you, you don't really need to um, look into the details about you know how many people are attending, that kind of thing. The second thing is exactly about the, the questions that are already brought up by other speakers is, is, is about transparency. Uh, if you need to convince ordinary people that you know all this setup, our KPIs are important, and then you can deliver it, and then we look at the output um, and outcome. Um, and then you need to show us the data. Um, you need to really convince the people that you know there's a trend and, and, and so on. Instead of you know like recently um, we're talking about you know whether uh, visitors to Hong Kong during the um, uh, Ch Chinese New Year period. 
suddenly you shift it to comparison with 2018 instead of 2019, which I find is quite funny. Um, because 2019, Chinese New Year, is still before you know all these uh, confrontations. So that year would can be a reference. But why you jump to 2018? Well, it really doesn't matter because we all know about how to play with statistics. But then the thing is, if you say that you know I'm 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 all the way going down to the KPI role, you need to be consistent. You need to be transparent. And at the end of the day, all you also need to tell people about the overall strategy because okay, you you want to keep on building public housing, you want to say farewell to partition unit, fine. Uh, but would that be the policy initiative five years down the road, 10 years down the road? Who is going to complete that, that task? Why this would be the vision of Hong Kong society? Who said so? You know, who, 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 who think that you know, this is the consensus that everyone would, would espouse? Um, then again, back to all these points that we have raised at the end of the day is about longer term visions, it's about transparency, it's about engagement, it's really about talking to the people. Yeah, and I would add something about, I'm actually teaching KPIs next week, so I've got this <laughs> top of mind. This is great. I'm going to make my students watch this video because you've just like encapsulated my course. Um, but, you know, one of the things that KPIs have a lot of a lot of purposes, and one of them is learning, right? We set KPIs, but we're not always 100% sure that we have the right number or the right target. We talk a lot about making your target and missing the mark, which is like, yes, we got X number of units, but we're not actually necessarily solving the problem the way we want, for example, right? And that, that this, one of the things we mentioned on this panel, I heard many times was the ability and willingness to go back and learn, right? Which means maybe you made the KPI and didn't get your outcome, or maybe you didn't get your KPI and didn't make your outcome. Maybe you didn't make your KPI, but you did get your outcome. And, and so I think attached to KPIs has to be process of learning and adjustment, right? Because KPIs give us an idea of kind of what we did and where we are um, and maybe how we're doing, but that doesn't mean we're not gonna need readjustment, even if we make the KPIs, right? So I think that, that built in with good processes of learning is a really important part of it. Like KPIs for KPIs sake are just, oh, so much stuff we put on our website, right? It, it doesn't mean we're necessarily doing what we say we want or that we're getting what we, what, what we want out of them, right? Um, we have some, we have some, um, we've all been reading, we all look like we're staring on the videos because we're all trying to read the text on Difficult the board. To read. And it's kind <laughs> of small. I have a lot of glare from the <laughs> sunlight here. Thanks for the great presentations. I would like more to know about the view of the speakers on KPI management. Um, it's popular in the mainland and municipal governments, but I'm personally skeptical of the value in Hong Kong. It seems that each bureau is working on their own based on their KPI checklist, and it seems poly policy formulation itself is getting lower and lower coordination between departments because of too much focus on meeting their KPIs and their efficiency. We seem to be heading to the extreme of pursuing efficiency in the sacrifice of engagement, public engagement and participation, as well as the quality itself of policy formulation to some extent. Mm. Any comments to kind of finish off this KPI discussion? Uh, I'm not going to talk about KPI management since um, the speakers, everyone has been talking about this, but I, I want to address the last bit on the sacrifice of public engagement participation, as well as the quality of policy formulation in the, pers in the pursuance of efficiency. I think one of the key things these days, I think generally public, ordinary citizens are really frustrated or they kind of are feeling hopeless in, in some way is because they are finding it is difficult to convey their views or in any way to be able to make their voice heard. Mm. That's one thing. And even recently we have heard a lot of international community, people from international community talking about their concerns about foreign interference or foreign influence, which I am particularly worried about because I I talk to a lot of civil society organizations, international human rights group, and then I would be wondering, oh, would would I be, you know, like working, you know, would I be breaching the NSL? Would I get myself in trouble? And and I think these things the government has never been really directly addressing. And and I believe that Hong Kong, apart from being one of the the, the cities in China, is also having is being one of the international cities in the world. And being one of the international cities in the world, I think the government 
does have its obligation to clarify the policies and engage themselves with different stakeholders and including the international community. And I think instead of jumping into defense, um, in every single front about the, you know, the law, they have to listen and they have to clarify and elaborate or even making amendments when it's needed. And I think this is what I, I would call a responsible government would do. And I think this is actually very important. And at the moment, why people are feeling so frustrated or hopeless is because they, they, are, they feel like they're talking to a wall. They feel like there's nowhere they can, they can talk or they can express themselves. And even with the international community, and so the only thing people can do is just go away. And I think this is something they have to understand, um, the position of Hong Kong and what they want Hong Kong would be like in the future. I think that's a very important um, aspect. Do we have this other question that's on here? I think it's really I, I would like to come back to KPI. Okay, one more KPI. Why? <laughs> Not just because it's a very important topic in the teaching of public administration. It's important but also the because it's so practically yeah, useful. <laughs> but also because uh, the current term of government, in a way, tries to define itself by KPI. I mean, KPI, therefore action, implementation, speedy response, problem solved, uh, satisfaction on, on the part of the public. But of course, the, the, the matter is much more complicated. Uh, because ideally, KPI should be a process for every government department having understood what the public wants, the needs, having done sufficient research, and then try to come up with a reflex, uh, reflective process, what can be done to deal with the problem? Can we set a target? Can, uh, what kind of uh, resources are needed, the cost? I mean, cost is important because ultimately there are too many problems to be solved. So you have to decide on your priority. But if the process is absent and you just come up with a KPI, just say, okay, I want this. I mean, it's not as simple as that particularly for the delivering agents. If they are forced to come up with KBI, then their mind is not under KBI, so the process will be absent. So I think KBI is important to that extent, but so only if you do a KBI properly, and that takes time, that takes commitment. And uh, earlier, Patrick and Isabella and some others, they, they mentioned the importance of transparency, and I fully agree with that. But Behind transparency must be honesty. The government has to be honest about the problems. I mean, sometimes, uh, that's what I heard from many people I've talked to, uh, uh, they feel that perhaps the government seems to be in another world. The government, the government is not on the ground in understanding the real problems. So I think the government has to convince people that the government understands what's happening. And the government is willing to share its views, its priorities, and also willing to share statistics so that we have an informed discussion with the community. So I think uh, honesty is very important. In because even if they do, even if they are on the ground, if people don't believe them from the mm. way they speak. Like you said, right? They don't. They don't have the vision of why you have mm. this waste charge. They don't express what the problem is. They're just telling you the fines and the features and whatever. Then people feel like, do they really know what's going on? Even if they do, right? Because otherwise, you have no way to know. Yeah. Uh, uh, I wanted to add one more point on KPI. Who <laughs> would have thought <laughs> this was the hot button issue of the day? Who is going to track the progress of KPI? Because, you know, in year 2002's policy address, there were, I think, more than 100 or maybe 200 KPIs. And my question is, uh, who is looking, you know, after uh, all these, you know, who, who is going to track the progress of KPIs? Uh, what reminds me here is that, you know, in the UK, at the cabinet level, they were talking about, you know, establishing a post called head of, you know, uh, policy effectiveness or something like that. So that post, uh, 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 you know, the role is to observe or, get or the monitor or the, po the progress and the problems of all the policy issues. So I'm thinking in Hong Kong, who is taking up this role? Maybe, okay, uh, the deputy for administration uh, should do that, okay, because, you know, every time uh, after policy mistakes. He came out and then he said that he would take over the issue. So I think in Hong Kong, we need a person 
okay, to, to take the role of you know, tracking the progress of all these KPIs, if that is possible. Uh, yeah. I would li also like to add a point on KPI. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> well, I think the, c the questions raise a very interesting point about the relationship between uh, KPI and uh, policy coordination. Mm -hmm. Because um, you will see that um, if uh, there is uh, too much emphasis on uh, KPI, and, um, and each bureau and department uh, put this KPI on the very top of the list, then there will be a side effect. The side effect of uh, building up silos. silos. And uh, because they're all very much concerned about whether they achieve the KPI of their department or their unit, so uh, they, they, they would uh, 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 seek to achieve it even at the expense of uh, the interests of other parties and or the of course the overall interest of the whole uh, policy. So that raised the point about the policy coordination because nowadays, um, you know, it, it basically each and every policy unit uh, usually cut across more than one bureau or department. So uh, policy uh, coordination at the top level uh, uh, is very important. And so you always uh, can, uh, when whenever uh, the government come up with a policy, uh, you can always ask yourself a question, who's in charge? Who's in charge? So policy coordination, coordination goes with accountability. So that means that who's taking the responsibility, ultimately taking that responsibility. If you couldn't find a single officer who are taking charge of the issue, that is very likely that the issues will go messy. Okay, we have one more on here. Unless is there one more in the room? Okay, we'll do one more in the room um, to, you know, as an incentive for people to be in the room. And if we have time, we'll take this one about the the issues with trust in the young younger generation, which I think is important. Okay. Uh, thank you for the speakers. So I would like to know. Uh, uh, I would especially want to hear the response from Dr. Isabella Ng, but also welcome to the other speakers. So uh, with the. Uh implementation or the legislation of the Article 23 of the Basic Law um, ahead, very likely to be completed uh, within this year or this half year. So do you anticipate, as the name suggests, this is uh, the public uh, about changing order. So do you anticipate a brand new changing order different from the NSL or like a completely new or like or the uh, new way of changing order. Yes. So, do you anticipate any new challenges or new ch problems ahead with the implementation? Yes. Thank you. Um, I have to be frank. Yes, I am anticipating a lot of uh, problems ahead. First of all, is within the local community. How are people viewing? this whole change of the Article 23. Now, of course, the government has been trying very hard to explain to the community that we are going to clarify or we'll have check and balance on Article 23, right? And we have also heard from the, the, uh, the head of the Security Bureau talking about maybe people misunderstand this Article 23. Now, whether there is a misunderstanding or whether it's you know, things that we need yet to be clarified. General public are really, and the, I would say, um, they're anxious. They are facing, after the national security law, another law that they've been really worried about. I think everybody remember the days when there was huge protests going outside, right? Because of Article 23. And the international community recently have also raised their concern about foreign interference, isn't it? And that is going to be um, affecting, impacting how international community is going to see Hong Kong. So whether there is a new changing order or not, people already assuming that there will be a new change. Now this is something what Kara was just, just talking about, art, and Patrick was talking about that that policy, making a science and art. How can the government communicate itself clearly uh, with this new change? It's, as I would say, is paramount. And it's very important because that would affect very much Hong Kong's future, new position. Whether it can still continue, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm breaching the NSL now, whether Hong Kong is, can still continue to be 
the International Financial Center or still maintain its position, that would really depend on how the government communicate this change. And I think they really have to pay attention to that. Yeah, and I, I'll, I'll step in as a the person on here is probably the member of the international community, right? And I'm, I'm a policy scholar with an American passport who works with foreign collaborators who work for lovely sustainability NGOs. And if we write something that is academically critical of circular economy policies in Hong Kong, now that should be fine, mm. but no one will clarify if that's fine, which means my academic partners start to be like, there's some uncertainty here, right? And again, if people bring that up and we're told, oh, this is something we should look into. Let's clarify. We understand your opinion or your concern. Let's talk about it. That's very different than saying, oh, no, this dissent is the result of foreign interference. Right. So the way that the government talks about it doesn't necessarily leave people who have legitimate questions about where they fall feeling like they're in a comfortable position. Right. So I think, again, this is kind of about the art of communication. It's like, I honestly don't think anyone's going to come after me for writing a, an academic article studying with other experts, circular economy or the waste charging in Hong Kong. But, you know, the way that you talk to me about it is what might give me concern, right? Like you say, oh, yeah, because then it's like, well, but you could one day if you wanted to, right? And again, so I think that, that these issues around communication and how you deal with voice and how you engage with people in ways that allow for real dialogue make a real difference to how people perceive it and what their levels of anxiety are, even if the anxiety is, in fact, unfounded. Because people, mm. that's what people act on, right? Tricky. It's very tricky. Well, le le let me come. I, I don't want to be too definite about what might happen. Mm -hmm. But, of course, judging from the sentiments, the uh, people, I mean, it's all ultimately, as Kira rightly pointed out, a communication is a matter of perception. Uh, fear is the fear of the unknown, right? You don't know the consequences. Now, um, ideally, I mean, f on the matter of national security, uh, particular Article 3, there is a constitutional obligation under the basic law. We have to do it. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you look around the world, every country, every city has got its own version of national security legislation. Now, the reason why other cities, I mean, you may argue, why is that not a big issue? It might have been a big issue in certain uh, countries when the law was uh, first set up. I mean, I remember uh, after 911 in the U.S., where the U.S. passed the Patriots Law, there was... That was not debate. uncontroversial. I was a university student. We protested a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, y because, but then, of course, looking back, now, you can make a judgment whether that was overkill, was the law properly enforced, what are the consequences. But right now in Hong Kong, because in the past we, we didn't have uh, NSL per se, or Article 20 wasn't translated in a set of law. So now, because of the current uh, political situation, people begin to wonder. It's a matter of perception. Now, for corporations, they don't have the experience, so they ask the lawyers, and I can assure you many lawyers in Hong Kong, they are not too sure mm -hmm. of how to interpret the law. And they try to come up with the most risk-averse advice. Once you take that advice, you won't do many, too many things. Now, I think, so it's all a matter of interaction. Mm -hmm. uh, the same for government. Uh, I don't think our, our government, uh, until more recently, uh, is too um, involved in terms of operating under national security regime, per se. Again, experience. Even the court, we don't have proper jurisdictions yet, because this is a new thing. We don't have too many uh, cases, too much case law. So I would think that uh, it depends on how we, we as a community, government, NGOs, uh, lawyers, for example, academics, how we play our own role. And I would entirely agree with what Patrick said in his uh, presentation. We need to play each one's role. We want to make the best out of the situation. Yes, we do need to operate under certain parameters, how to make the best out of those parameters. And I hope the government will do the same. Uh, just to supplement on what uh, Kara and Anthony just said, um, the government really needs to communicate and clarify a lot of things regarding Article 23. And the reason is 
international community like um, collaborators at you know I heard from other universities outside they actually have listed different you know universities in in different places and put them like oh these you can freely work with this these you know universities in these places you have to put them on watch list universities in certain countries please don't engage with them and Hong Kong is already on the watch list so this is a kind of I think alarming sign um, that the government would need to engage more and communicate clearly um, that what is happening and and to sort of what we say to trying to make people understand the, the reasons the rationale and to clarify so that it can allay fear of the you know the local as well as the international community I think this is actually very important okay I have one last question I know we're, we're over time, but I think this is a really important one because I don't want—I honestly don't want to end on an Article 23 uh, and KPI <laughs> discussion. And I think we have a lot here, but this is an interesting question. I think it's not unrelated. It, it says uh, Hong Kong has experienced a si substantial rise in immigration. And I think we probably also mean emigration, mm. along with a sense of disappointment among the local youth. And what actions can government undertake to rebuild trust amongst the public, especially amongst our younger generation? Generation, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, uh, my view is that um, I think the current, uh, you know, the discourse or the or the saying uh, about you know the current political system uh, often you know evolves uh, around the value of overturning the old system. Um, of course, um, you know, uh, from Patrick's PowerPoint, we learned that there are obvious you know weaknesses of the old system, but it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, uh, we, we, we admit that the old system uh, is not perfect, but then uh, are there something that is worth keeping or, or you know, uh, you know, and uh, inherit uh, to the current system? Say like values uh, like uh, public participation, engagement, or, you know, uh, scrutiny from the legislative council. I think uh, we are not trying to, you know, uh, over overturn uh, the old system but to incorporate you know, the strength uh, of the old system uh, to the new system. And then, uh, but I think, okay, in, in my view, uh, Hong Kong uh, is yet to establish a comprehensive discourse and practice um, on the value of the new system. So I think if you need to convince uh, the people to stay, you need to tell them that actually uh, we are, you know, uh, you're, we are not just saying, you know, abolishing all the old things, but we are, you know, incorporating the strength of the old system to the new. So I think uh, this would be a very important uh, you know, way to convince the people to stay uh, in Hong Kong. Okay, uh, let me just put forward two points. Uh, first, yes, uh, migration. Now, Hong Kong is an open city. I mean, all along over these, uh, the, uh, the past decades with people coming in, people going out, no problem. And Hong Kong welcomes people from all over the world uh, to come to work, to, to set up their business in Hong Kong. But if we are simply trying to get more people in because there are a lot more people getting out, then there is an issue that we need to deal with. How do we retain the talent that we already have? Because if Hong Kong is a place perceived by others as inducing a local talent, a talent to leave, that is not good branding. Right, uh, so, I mean, we are not a cluster for attracting talent, so I think we must. While we are trying our best to, work, to attract people from outside, we should also try to understand why people are living and to do something about that. And for that, I would suggest one important KPI for government. <laughs> After the unrest in the current era of restoring order and moving from stability to prosperity, and the KPI is how to really win back the hearts and minds of young people. And I think that goes back to this question of strategy again, right? And, and you know, we say from, s uh, you know, stability to prosperity, but what, you know, I work with young people a lot. Some of us around here spend a lot of time talking to, to Hong Kong uh, uh, younger generations. And what they want is often fairly straightforward, but they don't feel like that's heard, right? And they want, they want a nice life. They, they want to be able to have a place to live and be able to have families and 
successful careers and yes making money is nice but i think it's more holistic than that and they want a vision that reflects the kind of world they want hong kong to be and how hong kong is going to respond to these global challenges like climate change and and things that they care a lot about right and so i think that the strategy question is really like this vision that I- if they don't feel like there's enough of a vision and we're just bumping from one problem to another i think it's harder to to win back the hearts and minds as opposed to a project they feel they have a part and a stake in. Uh, uh, a couple of points. Uh, first, uh, it takes two to tangle. So um, th- is this the communication, the interactions um, between the two. Uh, secondly, it's about um, A, to get the uh, facts and figures right, the situation, the understanding right. Uh, for example, uh, I think for a very long time uh, about the understanding about the constitutional order in Hong Kong, the systems in Hong Kong and all that, a proper understanding about the one country, two systems uh, policies and all that, these are fundamental. Thirdly is uh, to, um, for, for the administration of the government to review themselves. You know, if I, I, I have trust in you, I need to know you. So you need to review yourself about your thinking, your values, your priorities, uh, what you think about all these things and all that. And the final point is about um, let the uh, young, younger generations to see for themselves, to expose, um, to understand about this place, understand about the country, uh, and uh, rather rather th- and uh, just relying on uh, lecturing and all that. You know, uh, I always find that uh, when I did the uh, you know the Greater Bay Area development, uh, I always uh, suggest that whenever the public uh, or the younger generations uh, visits the GBA areas, it's very important uh, for the organizations to give them sufficient uh, space and leeway. Uh, so that they expose among themselves and not to attend all these, uh, you know, uh, official meetings and all that. The best way is that they would give them three days, you know, look around, take the express train, and then at the, of at the end of the day, please do a presentation on your takeaway. I think that's the, uh, you know, most effective way of uh, engaging the youth. Okay, I think we're well over time now. So thank you, everyone, for staying late. I know it's lunchtime. Um, Thank you to my wonderful panel for what I think was a really important discussion um, with some really important views. And you know, honestly, I think a lot of well-deserved positivity in terms of Hong Kong's future, which you know, it's not easy for anyone in this day and age. So, um, and uh, but how negative can you be with that view behind us? <laughs> Online, you can't see, but <laughs> Hong Kong is one of the most gorgeous spots on the planet. So, beautiful city. It's just such a beautiful city. So, thank you guys so much. And there is one more, I think, for this year. It's on April thirteenth. Thir- and we will talk about our annual discussion on the One Country, Two Systems 2.0 this time. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.